passage that's going to guide our time of worship together this morning can be found in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. We're going to study the parable that Jesus gives of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Now, if we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Patrick. I get to serve you here at Open Door as the director to the high school students and their families. Now, part of that role means that once a year, every summer, uh, myself and our middle school director, Kenneth Brock, we get to take the students to a summer camp. And so if you see anyone wearing one of the blue shirts that says made in his image, that's one of our students, one of the 50 students, 50 plus students that we were able to take down to Ridgecrest uh, to hear God's word preached. It was a sweet, sweet time. And you might be familiar with the speaker. He's one of our former elders in the the president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Jamie Dew. And so if you see that, ask the students, how was it? Uh, hopefully that they enjoyed their time. I have learned that the longer I do student ministry, the more acetaminophen I need every time I go on a student camp. And so I took enough to kill a small horse, but I'm here this morning and I feel pretty good, to be honest. And so we're going to continue this morning in our series of Stories with Jesus. And what we're trying to do as a church here this summer at Open Doors, we want to study the different parables that Jesus gives us in the New Testament. And we want to ask the question, what should we love? By studying the parables, we want to see what Jesus is drawing out. We want to study and want to ask the question, what should we love? Well, with the text that we're about to approach to this morning in Luke 18, the answer is quite clear that we are to love righteousness. We are to love righteousness. But brothers and sisters, I want to be very clear with you this morning. We are not to love what our definition or what our perception of what our understanding of righteousness is, but what God's definition and understanding of what righteousness is. Last week, Nate Aiken spoke about how oftentimes in society today, we have a tendency to redefine terms for our own benefit. And the more that we redefine these terms, the further away we get from the intention of what God means when he uses them in Scripture. So now love today has been redefined as acceptance. Truth today is becoming more and more redefined as what your truth is, your personal truth. And what is good is being redefined as what pleases you in that moment. But brothers and sisters, if, if our understanding of what love is and what truth is and, and what righteousness is, if our understanding does not align with what Christ prescribes and describes within the scriptures, then it is good for nothing. And so I want us to study this morning, what does it mean to love righteousness? I like to think about this alignment uh, like this. I've been married for almost four years now. And when I first got married, I was oftentimes asked by my wife to select an outfit that that goes best with her attire. Uh, maybe you remember she would come out uh, holding up two shirts or two dresses or, or two different types of shoes. And I was ignorant enough and naive enough early on in marriage to think that she really cared about my fashion sense. And so what I would do is I would weigh all the options. I would take the the options that she put in front of me, and I would consider the style. I would consider the colors. I would consider the event that we were doing. Would there be a need to run away from any apparent danger? Well, if so, she needed closed-toed, closed-heeled shoes, right? But if we were going out for, for a fun, fancy evening, then, then maybe the heel would work. And so I would consider all these different things, and I would, I would plug them into my formula, and I would produce my answer. Now, I thought that I would have a lot of weight in this conversation, uh, not to brag, but I've been dressing myself since the fourth grade. And so I thought I, I brought a lot of experience and that she really did care about what I said. But as it turns out, I'm, I'm a little bit of a slow learner, but I eventually learned she could care less about what my opinion was. She was just hoping that it would align with hers, right? The only reason why she asked me is because I was the only thing in the house that actually held a pulse. And so it wasn't that I was her best option, but I was actually her only option. And so I like to think about that when we come to what, it, what, what does it mean to love? What does it mean to, to know truth? What does it mean to be righteous? We can come up with a, a fluffy or, or this incredible definition of these terms, but unless it aligns with God's, it is good for nothing. And so let's look at Luke chapter 18 and let's study this morning. What does it mean to love righteousness? Well, Jesus gives us this parable. And as he does so, Luke actually provides the introduction with verse 9. And so Luke, as he is guided by the Holy Spirit, he writes this. 
And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Now we have to understand the context of what we're looking at here. We're picking up this morning in Luke chapter 18. And this is towards the end of Jesus's ministry, maybe even at the middle. And so what we need to know is Jesus has been preaching. Jesus has been teaching consistently ever since Luke chapter four. This isn't his first rodeo. And so by the time that we find ourselves in Luke chapter 18 this morning, everyone would have known of who Jesus was. Everyone would have looked for him. By Luke 18, whenever Jesus walked into a town, people would, would bombard him, hoping that, that they would see a miracle, hoping that he would heal them. Others would come and sit at Jesus' feet, just, just wanting to hear his sweet teaching. Some people would come and approach Jesus and, and try to get him to slip up, and they might challenge his authority. Others would come to Jesus in order to try to make him king, while others approached Jesus and wanted him to be killed. But here's the point, regardless of what their motivation was, when Jesus spoke, everyone listened. When Jesus spoke here in Luke 18, everyone was prepared to listen, especially because just a few chapters before, Jesus has begun to teach on what does it mean to enter into the kingdom of heaven, uh, an idea, a doctrine of quite a particular interest and so Jesus is going to continue on this teaching, and he gives the audience for who this parable is for. Luke says that it is for the self-righteous, the self-righteous, verse 9. So we have to ask, well, who is this self-righteous person? Who is this person that this parable is for that trusts in their own righteousness? Well, to be self-righteous is one who believes that their righteous standing before God is based off of merit. And so to trust in your own righteousness is to believe that you, apart from God, can do enough good things that, that you can give enough money in order to obtain a right standing before the Father. Self-righteousness is not based on faith. It's not rooted in Christ. It's wholly dependent on you. And so for the self-righteous person, they forget the cross and they focus on themselves. And so to be self-righteous is to have this attitude of saying, Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross. That was really cool. That was moving, Jesus. That was motivational, Jesus. That was inspiring. But look at what I can do as well. Look at my works. Look at what I add. To trust in your own righteousness is to say that the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of our lives, got it wrong. To trust in your own righteousness is to say that if I would just do a little bit more, if I would be better, if I would give more, if I would have better church attendance, if I would drink less, then I would earn merit, then I would earn a right standing before God. But we see how insane that sounds, right? That we, the created, would ever question or challenge the creator. Not only the author, but also the sustainers of our lives. Yet, in moments of weakness, in moments of sin, this little self-righteous person within us might come out. We will take this book that was perfectly fashioned for us, that was written for us and signed by the Holy Spirit, and we might set it off to the side and come back to it when it's more convenient. Sometimes when this little self-righteousness comes out of us, we make our lives less about Jesus and what he did on the cross and more about us, less about what he did, and, and we make it more about what we can do. Pastor and theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he speaks on this in his book, Cost of Discipleship. He calls this cheap grace, and he defines it like this. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. It's grace without the cross. It's grace without without Jesus Christ. And that's who this parable is for. That's who Jesus is speaking to. Those who puff up themselves to make themselves better, and consequently by doing so, they belittle the work that Christ did on the cross. And so as we approach Luke 18, as we read through and study verse 9, we see that the scene has now been set, the audience has been addressed, and now what Jesus is going to do in the following verses, is Jesus is going to introduce to us the main characters. So let's see what he says in verse 10. Jesus says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And what we see is Jesus, the master storyteller, does what he does best. 
he's, he's giving this parable, he's giving this teaching right in front of a crowd, and what he's going to use is two of the most common, most well-known people within Jewish society, two people that were radicals. They could not have been more opposite of each other, the Pharisee and the tax collector, these radicals that everyone would have been very familiar with. Both of them would have needed no introduction. But let me catch us up to speed. The first person that Jesus brings forth for this parable is, is the Pharisee. Now at this time, everyone would have seen the Pharisee as, as the standard for what it meant to live a righteous life. If there was anyone that was considered to be righteous by all Jewish measurements, it would have been the Pharisee. The Pharisee would have known the Old Testament law better than anyone else. They would have known all 613 laws, memorized them, and and followed them to the T. And as we're going to see in a moment, not only do Pharisees follow the laws, but they would actually create additional laws just to prove to everyone else how righteous, how religious, how good they were. Not only did they follow the law, but they would make up additional ones to really separate themselves. That was the Pharisee. The Pharisees, they were committed to, They were dedicated. They were loyal to the Jewish law. And by all standards of measurement among their peers, they were the righteous person. That's who Jesus introduces. But then on this side, Jesus says there's a Pharisee, but there's also a tax collector. Now, if the Pharisee would have been praised by Jewish society, it was the tax collector. He would have been despised. See, the tax collector, they worked for the Roman government. So they were already viewed by everyone else, their peers, their friends, if they had any, their family, they were viewed as traitors for working for Rome. Not only that, but what they did, their job, follow me here, you don't have to use your imagination much. It's, it's in the title. They collected taxes, right? But that wasn't the only thing they did. They didn't stop there. What gave tax collectors a bad rap is, yeah, they would take the tax required for the Roman government, but then they would take more. They would get greedy and they would hire out criminals and they would hire out robbers to come and intimidate everyone else to give them more money. And every dime that the tax collector received greater than the tax that was needed was considered profit for themselves. So over here you have the Pharisee, the righteous person. Over here you have the the tax collector, the thief and the thug of the community. And what Jesus is going to do is He's going to give us a parable in which this tax collector, this thug and sinner, is going to show us what it means to truly turn from sin and to be made righteous. Meanwhile, the Pharisee, the righteous standard of society, is who Jesus selects to show us what it truly means to live an unrighteous life. This would have been a radical move. This was a bold statement, and it definitely would have captured everyone's attention. So Jesus, now that he has set the stage and introduced the characters, look at what he says in verse 11. He says this, The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this here tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that we get. And the first thing that we notice when we approach this parable is the position that the Pharisee is in. What position do we see him in in verse 11? Standing. He's standing, right? Pharisee standing. Now that doesn't cause us any red flags at first. When we pray today, oftentimes we pray standing. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, we see in the Old Testament that it was Hannah in 1 Samuel who who prayed while standing to God the Father. And the psalmist writes that we stand in awe in front of God and we commune with him. That sounds like we're praying there, right? And Jesus, when he teaches on prayer in Mark 11, he actually says that we can stand, that we are to stand when we pray. So it's, it's not the position of the Pharisee that causes us any concern. Instead, it is the motive behind now, what, what we have to recognize, church, is this, par- this, this parable is very short. Jesus was very intentional with each description that he gives. And so what was the motive? Why? Why would the Pharisee choose to stand? And why did Jesus see that it was important to mention that? Well, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he addresses this very thing. In Matthew 6, he says this, When you pray, 
you are not to be like the hypocrites, or in this case, the Pharisee. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by man. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward in full. And so what we see is that this Pharisee was not standing to pray. He was standing to be seen. This Pharisee was standing in the middle of the temple so that everyone could come and say, look at him. Look at how good he is. Look at how righteous this man is. So everyone might look and say, I I see this guy up at the temple twice a day, every day at nine o'clock and at three o'clock. And he's always praying. He must be righteous. But we learn that, that in reality, he wasn't really praying to God, right? He was just boasting up himself. That he was standing so that others might see him, so that attention might be drawn to him, so that he might appear to be good in front of everyone else. And brothers and sisters, if we're being honest, we're prone to have this same heart and we're prone to have this same motivation as well. To have this desire to be seen, to be heard about how good we are, about how religious we are. Sly comments that point to how good we are, we might make in conversation or post on social media that might portray how religious we are. We have a tendency at times, if we're being honest, to want the world to see us and who we are, and how good we are. But yet, brothers and sisters, if that is our main motivation, then Jesus' response is quite clear. He says if, if our motive for prayer is just to be heard, to be seen, to be deemed righteous by other people, then, then we don't need him. We don't even want him. Jesus says if that is our motivation, then, then our reward has already been given. He says, congratulations, you've earned it. You've got the attention you got the attention that you so desired. I have nothing else to offer. That should be scary. We should recognize that that we can't allow these things to try to make ourselves look good and take away from the glorious reality of who the Father is. That Jesus says that when we do these things that we receive in full that which we already want, but it is my prayer open door church, that we might strive for something far greater, that we might strive for a a reward in which not moth nor dust can destroy, but that is safe for us in heaven, something that is found in only knowing Christ. And so the first thing that we see is the position of the Pharisee that he is standing, but next we see who he is talking to or who he is praying to. Jesus says that he is praying to himself. Now there's two different school of thoughts that we can take when we see that this Pharisee was praying to himself. The first is that he was simply talking to himself. Now, we might do this, right? We, we talk to ourselves uh, when someone cuts us off in traffic. We might even encourage them on what the laws really are. We talk to ourselves sometimes when one of our favorite sports teams takes a 28-3 to lead in one of the biggest events of all time, and then they decide to blow it. We might talk to ourselves in that moment, and we might feel justified. We might even try to give some advice on what they should do differently, right? So oftentimes we talk to ourselves. I remember my grandfather, he told me that he only talks to himself when he needs expert advice because he doesn't know anyone else to go to, right? So we could read this passage and, and the fact that Jesus says that he was praying to himself and understanding that he was simply talking to himself, but, but I don't think that's really the case. I don't think this prayer was ever intended for God in the first place. And so I believe that when Jesus says that this Pharisee was talking to himself, he wasn't praying to God. He was trying to edify. He was trying to glorify himself. And let me show you why. Look at what he says in verse 11. This prayer begins with, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. You might say, well, well, Patrick, he's, he's not praying to himself. He's clearly praying to God. Look at who he addresses at the very beginning. He says, God, to which I will say, not so fast. If this Pharisee wanted the people around him to truly believe that that he actually was praying, he would have to open up his prayer with God, right? He would have to. That would be the standard. That would be his way of showing everyone that I'm praying. But I want to argue that this prayer wasn't for God. God is never the subject of the prayer. In fact, the subject of the prayer, he doesn't take long to get to. Look at what he says right after God. The Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. This prayer is only two verses long. That's two sentences in the English. 
And within that short span of time, this Pharisee references the personal pronoun I five times. The subject of this prayer was never intended to be God. It was never about God. It was never for God. The subject of this prayer was about himself. He says, God, I thank you. I'm not like other people. I'm not like the swindlers. I'm not unjust. I'm not like the adulterers. Essentially, what he's saying is, is God, don't you dare compare me to everyone else. I'm different. I'm separate. I'm special. This Pharisee says, God, don't you, don't you dare compare me to one of the swindlers. I'm not like them. He says, don't you dare compare me, God, to, to one of the unjust people in this society. I'm not like them. He says, God, don't you dare compare me to, to one of the adulterers. I'm not like them. And then he adds this at the very end. He says, or even like this tax collector. He says, God, don't you dare compare me to someone who's deemed a sinner. Don't you dare group me in a category of someone like this here tax collector. Now remember, this prayer is not focused. It's not on. It is not about God. He simply references so that everyone, everyone believes he is praying. Instead, the prayer is about himself. And so when he prays this, when he says, thank you that I'm not like these people, he has to give, he has to give a more information as to show that I'm so different. I'm not even on the same plane. I'm not even on the same level as them. So he edifies himself all the more in verse 12. Look at what he says to really make his argument on how separated he is. He says, I fast twice a week and I pay tithes of all that I get. I fast twice a week and I pay tithes of all that I get. Church, this is what we have to recognize in and of themselves. The fasting and the paying of tithes are good things, but they are not the ends. Fasting and paying tithes are ways that we worship the Lord. We fast so that we take away the things that our body needs in order to come to know Christ a little bit more and to rely on him. We pay tithes. We're told to pay tithes that we're to be generous and cheerful givers to the church. These are good things, but the Pharisee always seems to take it one step too far. He says, I fast not once, but twice a week. I remember the Pharisee of all people would have known the law. The Old Testament law requires that the Jew is to fast once a year on the day of atonement. Just once a year they were to fast. But like I said earlier, Pharisees would come up with additional laws just to show how separated they were than anyone else. And so this particular Pharisee, and we have good reason to believe that Paul before he came to know the Lord, would also fast twice a week. Once again, not as a motive of worship, not to say, God, I, I just want to come to know you. God, I just want to know you a little bit more. But instead, they fasted so that everyone might see how hungry they were, how weak they were, how righteous they were. And then we see the paying of the tithes. Once again, a good thing that this Pharisee turns into a sin Jesus calls out the Pharisees on this in Luke chapter 11 before. Jesus says, but woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe and mint and rue on every kind of garden herb and yet disregard justice and the love of God. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, you spend so much time trying to make sure that you do everything to a T, that you go out in your garden and you separate 10% of even your herbs just so you can give them to the church not as a, a means of worship, but so that everyone else can see you and say, well, well, look at how dedicated he is. Look at how much he gives. And Jesus is saying, you have done this to the neglect of people and to the neglect of worship. So the Pharisee has turned something good and created an idol out of it. And brothers and sisters, we have to learn from this, right? This could very well be us. We have to recognize that we cannot turn a good thing, prayer, tithing, fasting, worship. We cannot take these good things that God has blessed us with and make something out of them that then promotes us. When God no longer gets the praise that he deserved, but instead becomes all about self-adoration and our self-glorification, then we have completely failed. Need I remind you that we were bought with a price we are not our own. We don't live for ourselves, but we live for the worship of the all-perfect, all-holy, all-righteous God, which drives Paul to say that to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
To live is not for our own comfort, for our own desires, for our self-edification, but to live is Christ. So Jesus gives us this idea of the Pharisee, this seemingly righteous person on the outside, but in reality, we learn that the Pharisee is nothing but a whitewashed tomb, beautiful on the outside, follows all the rules to a T, but on the inside is filled with nothing but dead man's bones. What Jesus does is he gives us a hope for you, he gives us a hope for me, and he gives us a hope for this Pharisee, and he gives us a hope for this tax collector. Because in this parable, he does something incredible. What he does is he tells us about reality as it is in sin, and then he's going to follow it up and show us reality as it is in Christ. And for this, he selects no other person but the tax collector, this thug, this thief, and this sinner to show what it truly means to repent, to turn from sins, and to be made righteous. Look at your scriptures. Look at verse 13. This is what Jesus says. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, the first thing that we notice when we read this, much like the Pharisee, is the position of the tax collector, right? While the Pharisee was standing, so too was the tax collector. But the only difference was that they were separated. We're, we're told that the Pharisee and the tax collector were some distance apart. Now, I have three theories as to why this was important enough for Jesus to add this to the parable. I want to lay all three out, and then I'm going to let you make your decision as to which one you think holds the truth and is why Jesus put it in here. The first two I think are good, but I, my goal is to really convince you of the third one. Here's the first one. Why? Why do we see that the Pharisee and the tax collector are so separated? Well, the first theory on the table is that it's because of the social stigma that was at play. We've already spoke about this, right? The Pharisee is this righteous standard. The tax collector is considered a sinner. No one wants to hang out with the tax collector. You don't invite tax collectors over to your house. You wouldn't invite a tax collector to your kid's t-ball game. You wouldn't be seen with them in public. In fact, Pharisees wouldn't even touch them because they thought that that would make them then unrighteous. And so we see this social stigma that surrounds the Pharisee and the tax collector. And so we have good reason to believe that the tax collector, understanding this social stigma, chose to separate himself from the Pharisee. Or on the other side, the Pharisee, knowing this social stigma, chose to separate himself further from the tax collector. That's a good theory. You can hold on to that one, put it in your back pocket. But hold on, we got another one. The second one's pretty good too. The second reason for why this tax collector and this Pharisee were separated could have been because of the authority that the Pharisees had. Not only were Pharisees known as the righteous standard, but they also were known to kick people out of the temple if they felt like it interrupted or if they felt like it made their time of worship of any less valuable. And so we could imagine that this Pharisee sees this tax collector, someone who is a sinner, and this tax collector could have very well known that his fate was to be kicked out of the temple, just not knowing when the time was. Oftentimes, Pharisees would send them out, and if the sinner, if the tax collector wouldn't leave under their own power, then they would be drug out by the eastern gate, through the eastern gate, rather. And so the second reason for why they're separated could have just been because of the authority that the Pharisee had, and the tax collector understood this. Both of those, I think, are good, but I don't think that gets really to the point. The third theory that I have, the one that I, I think is holds the most water, is the fact that when the Pharisee and the tax collector came to the temple that day, they both had radically different intentions. The Pharisee came that day to be seen and to be heard. Meanwhile, the tax collector came to the temple to be humbled and to be forgiven. In a really real sense, we see that the Pharisee came to be worshipped. Meanwhile, the tax collector came to worship. He showed up to the temple that day just to get a little bit more of God, just to see a little bit more of him, just to know him a little bit more. The tax collector showed up humbly submitting himself before an all righteous, all perfect, all holy God and said, God, I have nothing that I can give you, but in you I have everything that I can gain. The tax collector showed up to worship, 
prepare to worship, prepare to lay down his life, to bow at the king. Meanwhile, the Pharisee came to be worshipped, to be glorified himself, and to be edified. So here's my question, church. When we come on Sunday mornings, do we come with the heart prepared to worship? Do we come to church prepared to to sing songs and praises to an all-holy, all-righteous God? Do we come longing to to know more about God? Do we come with, with anticipation of the Holy Spirit working in incredible ways? Do we come knowing that the power of Christ can do incredible things, not only in us, but in the church and in the community as well? Do we come longing and wanting to worship, or do we come for any other motivation? Now, if you're a guest here this morning, I want to say on behalf of myself, on behalf of the pastors, and on behalf of the members at Open Door Church, we're excited that you're here. We're excited that you came to worship with us. I truly believe there is no greater place that you can be than right here, right now. But if you're a member of Open Door, it is my prayer that your motive this morning for coming to church was not one out of obligation, was not one out of routine, or anything else outside of a heart that desires to worship God. That was this tax collector. He just wanted to worship. That's my prayer for us as well. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a 20th century Welch pastor, said this, the chief end of preaching is to give men and women a sense of God and his presence. Is that what we came here for? Do we come here to worship, to know him, to experience a little bit more of him? Do we come for simply anything else? And we see that they were separated, the Pharisee and the tax collector. We see that the tax collector wasn't too concerned about his proximity to the Pharisee either, and so he goes on about his worship. And the tax collector prays this. Look at verse 13. He was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner think we get the idea, right? This tax collector shows up and he doesn't even have the ability. He just can't deal with his sin to even look up to the heavenly father. And so he looks down and he beats his chest as a sign of recognition for his sin and as repentance of it. And he says, God, be be merciful to me of all people, the sinner. Notice how the tax collector addresses himself. He doesn't say that he is a sinner, but he says he is the sinner. Because unlike the Pharisee, he wasn't concerned about comparing himself to everyone else. But in that moment, he just wanted to worship. It reminds me of Paul in 1 Timothy when he calls himself the chief of all sinners. And here we have this Pharisee saying that he is the only, he is the sinner. Open Door Church, let's make sure we get this right. This is not about some competition to see who has sinned the most or who is most separated from God. For we know that all sin separates us. But what Paul is getting at in 1 Timothy when he declares himself the chief of sinners, and what this tax collector is getting at in Luke 18 when he says he is the sinner, is they have both come to this recognition that they are fallen, that they are broken, and that because of their sin, they have been separated from the all-righteous, all-holy, all-perfect God. And they recognize that in that moment, they are not worthy that they are the sinner. They recognize that they could not do enough or be enough or give enough to merit God's favor, but because of God's grace that they have come to know him. Think about the words of Paul in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves, church. That is the gift of God. So you don't earn your righteous standing before God. You do not declare yourself righteous. How dare we? Remember what the prophet Isaiah says. He says that even our most righteous acts, when compared to an all-holy, all-perfect God, resemble that of filthy rags. But where there once was no way, God made one. By leaving his heavenly home, by humbling himself, by living a perfect life, and by taking on our sins at the cross, so that when he died, he bore our sin, our shame, and our guilt. And when we come to know him, when we enter into that relationship with him, he takes on our sin and we take on his righteousness. He makes us righteous. This free gift, this trade-off of sin for righteousness when we come 
to know the Savior. That is why Jesus ends this parable in verse 14 saying this, I tell you, this man, this tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he, he who humbles himself will be exalted. He who humbles himself, he who recognizes that his sin has separated them from an all-holy God, they would be exalted through the righteousness that we obtain in Christ. So now we circle back to the question that we asked at the very beginning. What then does it mean for us to love righteousness? What does that look like? Why is that important? Brothers and sisters, it's simple to love righteousness. is to simply strive to know God more, to be more like Christ every single day. I, I think David sums it up well in Psalm 19, 14. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David is saying, not just what I do, God, not just the thoughts that I have, but God, would you let the meditations of my heart resemble yours? God, would I love what you love and would I hate what you hate? God, would you make me more like you? Or another way to summarize it is what John says in John 3.30. He says that, he, God, must become greater, and I must become less. To love righteousness is to see Christ for who he is, to understand him for what he has done on the cross, and to know that we could never work or earn enough merit to gain favor, but because of what he did on the Christ, by placing our faith in him, we then receive righteousness. We are made righteous, he calls us into his family. It's a beautiful truth. And it's all found in this love letter that he has written for us. So church, it is my prayer that when we leave here, that we might be encouraged, we might be strengthened, that we might, we might recognize our righteous stand, standing before the almighty Savior and know that when we come to know him, he doesn't see us as a sinner. He doesn't see us as broken. He doesn't see us as fallen. He doesn't see us as a Pharisee or someone who once was a tax collector, but instead he sees us as he sees his son, as being made perfectly righteous. Would you pray with me?